We've all got that one crazy family member, that weird uncle or that weird aunt that you just kind of put up with. Or maybe you are that weird family member. Sometimes I think I'm that for my family. But here's the thing, your family can't be half as weird, half as diabolical as the Habsburg dynasty. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. If you wanna help support the channel, we have a Patreon page listed down below. I do wanna give a special shout out to our producer, Tiffany Monroe, and her 501c3, where she offers Reiki classes and sessions, as well as helping people with their spiritual disciplines. She is located here in Atlanta, but if you live elsewhere, you can always look at the website and contact her for certain services over the phone or over Zoom. And I want to give another shout out to our community member, Adam. Again, his book on multiverses, there's a snippet lifted, listed down below. He's an incredible writer. His email address has also lift, listed down below. If you know an agency or a scout or a publishing house that would be interested in reading his work to publish it, please, please contact him. We're all here just helping each other out, trying to make the world a better place. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we're going to be talking about Julius Caesar de Austria. Now, Julius was a Habsburg, not legally though, because he was the illegitimate child of Rudolf II. Rudolf II, our favorite Habsburg with his closet of occult knickknacks and crazy manuscripts. Now, of course, in 2020, we don't really look at this whole illegitimate thing as serious anymore. Many people are born out of wedlock it's no big deal in this modern time of ours. But for most of history, it's been a, a pretty big deal. Like your parents had to be married in order for you to be a legitimate heir to your father's fortune. For example, if a child was not born into a legalized marriage, a lot of the time the child would not carry the family's last name. Well, this was true with Julius. He was the oldest of Rudolph's illegitimate children. In fact, Rudolf didn't even have legitimate children. That's how much of a, a quirky oddball he was for his time in history. He did, however, though, have a long time mistress by the name of Catherine Strada. I mean, I know court politics are uh, a different life than any of us are even used to or would even understand now in modern times, but like, why didn't he just marry Catherine? Was she not up to snuff for his regal dynastical blood of the Habsburgs? You see, Rudolf II and Catherine had six children, quite a hefty brood for the Holy Roman Empire and for them not to be legal children. But you see, Rudolf did what he could to claim his children back in those days. No, they still didn't carry his last name, nor would they be able to become the emperor or empress because they weren't born into wedlock. However, he did provide them with really good educations and prepared them for having really powerful roles in court life. That's as good as it gets in this time in our history. Now, Julius was born in 1584, and again, his dad really worked to help him make something of his illegitimate life. It seems that Rudolf II really, truly loved his son. Now, the thing about our fair Julius is that even though he wasn't the legal son of Rudolf II, he was still the biological son of Rudolf II, meaning that he carried the Habsburg blood. Now, the Habsburgs, again, they're quite famous for inbreeding. In fact, Rudolf II's parents were first cousins. I mean, everybody in the Habsburg family 
married each other because they wanted to keep the bloodline pure. They wanted to keep the dynasty within their own people. We know that inbreeding causes a lot of medical problems. In fact, today we have certain laws where you can't marry somebody unless they're like so many generations apart from you. I think maybe in the state of Georgia, it's like they have to be your fourth cousin in order for you to be eligible to get married. I don't know if I can trace back a common ancestor with somebody is not happening anyway. I don't care for like 10th cousins. That's just too weird. It's not going to happen. But the Habsburgs along with a lot of monarchs in the day were totally cool with cousins mating. So the Habsburgs have become famous for a lot of deformations and mental issues as a result of years of inbreeding. One again, as we mentioned before, is the Habsburg chin, which is again believed to be a sign of inbreeding, the way the chin just dominates their whole face for the Habsburgs. Now, of course, they also are known to have a lot of heavy mental problems. We know that Rudolf II obviously struggled with depression as they called it back then, melancholy. He's not the only Habsburg to display signs of a mental disorder. Now, of course, because they are the Habsburgs, there was no really helping or explaining to them that what was going on with them was an issue with their brain and not just the divine right of God. I imagine living under a Habsburg reign could have in some cases been complete terror. Well, it seems that Julius also inherited some of the Habsburg's famous disorders. It appears that he was probably schizophrenic. No, you don't have to be inbred to have schizophrenia. Schizophrenia can happen to anyone, but it was common with the Habsburgs. Now, of course, this was the 1500s and this was a royal family. So understanding how to work with schizophrenia was not really a specialty of the times. And being that Julius was the son of Rudolf II, I'm sure that he got away with a lot. One could say he got away with murder, but that would be inaccurate. In 1602, Rudolf II purchased a castle located in the south of the Czech Republic. At this point, this was the southern part of Bohemia. This castle had existed since the 1200s, but the dynastical line that owned the castle had died out. It had been purchased and taken over by another family who then sold it to Rudolf. You see, Rudolf was doing what any good father would do. He was creating a seat for his son to give him his son some responsibility and a job in his kingdom. So in 1605, Julius moved into his new home. He was 21 years old. Well, it seemed that Julius grew quite an affection, an obsession with a young lady in the village. She was the Barbara's daughter. Her name was Marquetta, and obviously being the Barbara's daughter, she was obviously a lot lower on the social ladder than the illegitimate son of the Holy Roman Empire in those days. Well, I say in those days, but I mean, frankly, the royalty does live in a different reality than the rest of us. Because of his obsession, Julius asked Marquetta to live in the castle with him as his lover. Of course, they were not to be married, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, this would be socially beneficial to Marquetta's family. Well, maybe it would have been socially beneficial to Marquetta's family if Julius was a kind person. But you see, it seems that Julius was a bit of a tyrant. Tyrannical tendencies on top of his schizophrenia was hell for Marquetta. He re routinely beat her and cut her. And one night he thought he had killed her and so he tossed her body out the window. Well, it seems that she didn't die. In fact, she landed on soft 
padding. She made her way back to her parents' house where she took some time to recover. When Julius found out that Marquetta was still alive, he went back to her parents' house to demand that she move back into the castle. At this point, Marquetta's father put his foot down and said no. Well, because he said no, Julius had her father imprisoned and beaten for five weeks. After five weeks, her father relented and sent Marquetta back to the castle. And then on the 18th of February in 1608, Julius murdered Marquetta. But you see, the way in which he murdered her was completely maniacal. He cut her head off as well as other body parts. I don't know if this was fun for him or if he felt like he had a right to do this, I, I don't know. Well, you see, the thing is, is that Julius's father, Rudolph II, did not let his son off the hook. However, instead, Rudolph had his son imprisoned for life. Maybe the trauma of growing up with his uncle Philip in Spain and, and watching the torture of the Inquisition got to Rudolph to the point where he could not tolerate his son behaving in such a manner. His son eventually died in the prison in 1609. His schizophrenia had gotten so bad that he had refused to bathe. He was talking to himself, definitely not the healthiest of, of people. And after his death, they realized that an ulcer in his stomach had ruptured. Now, I don't know why a, a child of such privileged means would have an ulcer, but these are the Habsburgs. They are a cultist. There's probably a long line of trauma and traumatic rituals in their families. So not only did Julius inherit some of the traits of the Habsburgs, but he probably was exposed to a lot of stress as well. Unfortunately for Julius and for Marquetta, this resulted in him going crazy and murdering an innocent young woman, an innocent young woman who did not want to be where she was. But because of the statue of the ruling elite, she had no choice. And in fact, as we look back on history, we see how many people lost their lives on the whim of the king or the emperor, even the pope. And I get excited when I look forward into the future and I realize those days of divine right are coming to an end. Nasara and Jasara law will not allow that. And with Nasara and Jasara law and with the end of divine right, we will all be viewed as equal, equal in the eyes of the creator and equal through our governments. Governments run by the people for the people, not run by the likes of the Habsburgs. All right, thank you again for sitting through another story. Um, again, thank you to all of our Patreons. Please remember to check out Tiffany's website down below. Again, if you have signed up for Patreon and you haven't heard from me or haven't sent your story in, go ahead and email me the story that you want me to cover for this series. Again, thank you to Josh McKay for doing our music. A link to purchase the song, our opening song, is in the description box below. And thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me produce this video. Again, a link to his band, The Flying Mystics, are also listed in the description box below. I hope you guys have a great day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.